part two, if you like, of the, of the course. So we're finished with part one from the notes, which is all this about how we grab information, what's your work, what, what's your work, what takes time, how should we develop it, how do we grab that information, how do we go forward from there. This is part two of the notes, which is about understanding that there's a rich history and tradition of experimentation, background information and knowledge already contained in the UX and HCI. And these principles, which are already there, can be used to, quick, to speed up your process so that you're not always inventing from those principles. Um, there's four different parts. So there's principles of effective experience, principles of efficient experience, principles of um, affective, affective experience, and principles of engagement. Okay. We're going to cover all of those coming up to the summer, if that finish, which, seven, okay, just before your Easter vacation. Okay. okay, so the first thing to think about the principles of effective experience is that I'm going to tell you my egocentric view of all of this stuff. But there's also a view that's, that, that's held by, if you like, the community. Sometimes the community and I disagree, and sometimes we agree. I'm going to tell you both, so that you know the different things that we do and don't do that, and then you can make your own choice of You're also means that you can communicate with people who only know this one way of thinking. I would also hope that at the end of the course, at the end of the unit, you will have your own ideas about all of this, but you might have your own ideas about how you should pursue it. You should have your own vision for the future, etc. Okay? It's not just about me teaching you stuff that you take me in and die. Hold a second. Okay. So this is commonly called, I'm calling this effective experience, because I think it's about affecting some action. And I think that affecting an action, along it in computer terms, and occurs along the continuum of human individual difference. Okay? It's along the spectrum. Other people will say that this is accessibility. Okay? So accessibility is about making sure your software artifacts can be accessed <coughs> by users, specifically disabled users. Okay? You'll see that disabled users has now been increased to me, I'll get on to that, to me, people who are older, so senior citizens, whatever that means. I know I do. Okay. Okay. So apparently if you're old, you're also inherently disabled. Okay. So that's what it pretty much means. So this is what I want to give you as a definition. So effective um, uh, or accessible. To my way of thinking, these three terms mean the same thing. In reality, we're going to talk about accessibility. And you should be thinking about accessibility in more general terms. Okay. The reason why this is useful to think about is that if you're thinking about this and you're maybe selling it to your managers, that this is about everybody, the effective use of your technology by everybody, you get accessibility for free. But if you say, I'm going to develop for the niche accessibility market, Nobody will want you to develop those products. Okay? Because they'll say there's no point. Even though we know that worldwide um, spending power, buying power of people with disabilities runs to about 253 billion. But they won't know that. No one cares about it. They won't care. As far as they're concerned, it's huge. So that's why it's about everybody. This is because the concept of accessibility is much broader than the narrow confines of disabilities often associated with. You'll also see in your notes, and from now on, you'll see little bits here which are references. And when you've got this number in, I'm giving you the um, international standards. So this is a citation from the International Standards Organization of the actual international standard for accessibility. So as well as being, um, as well as seeing information about uh, references for, for just people, you know, like Ben Schneiderman, who's a big guy in HCI and these kind of people, you 
you're also seeing that there's an international standards reference, and you should look back to those international standards when you're, you're, when you're developing your software to make sure that you conform. Okay? If you don't conform to international standards, then it might be issue for you. And this international standards can be used to go through all the other stuff. If you don't conform to international standards, it might seem to you that this doesn't matter. But in reality, it means that you won't be able to sell into most companies. Okay? So your software will not be usable by most by, will not be sellable into most companies, especially big government, big government like the US. <coughs> okay. So, for instance, one of the we can we can argue that the reason why voiceover is on devices, not on Apple devices, is because Apple are glorious people and they wanted to make sure that there's a text to speech system for everybody to use and if you're blind then you can use it. Or if you're cynical, you might think that um, if they didn't do that, there would be no sales of Apple products to any of the And the same is true for Windows. The same is true for any of these platforms, right? Okay, so that's why so that's why they conform to ISO standards. So that's why you should conform to ISO standards. So my definition is this one at the bottom. The removal of all technical barriers to effective interaction. Okay? So I think that if you're that you shouldn't be creating technical barriers to effective interaction. Now it might not be efficient, but it, still means that it can happen, still be effective. Okay. So that's the that's good thing. Okay. So, access is for everybody. So this is a really good thing. So um, Boris Bikes, who knows Boris Bikes down in London? Okay, yeah. So Boris Bikes are shared bikes, shared bike and schemes. So here's what I do with access, okay? And then access is for everybody. So this is a development that works on a Nokia, it's a, it's a small Nokia device that's used in mobile phone. It's kind of a precursor to a watch. <coughs> it was done you know, five, five or six years ago um, by Nokia. And you can code things in, yourself. You might program to them yourself. And this one is an excellent mashup because the person who, people who were riding their um, virus bikes, when they were on their bike, they didn't know where they were free uh, slots to place them to, to uh, if you like, lock their Boris bikes back up into because they're all in a Boris bike, uh, they're all in Boris bike bike racks. So if there's no free slot, you technically can't move your Boris bike there. So how can you do this? You're cycling along to London traffic, you've got, you know, there's, there's cars everywhere, people running around, and you're cycling along. So you, what you have to do is get your phone out of your pocket, connect correctly to the right website, and then find out based on you know where you are, now you have location-based services, but you know where you are, uh, where the actual place is to store your bike. Okay? So there is an effective issue. You technically can't do that without stopping. If it's ready from taking your brain you off, driving it down, dropping it to the right website that you know about and finding out typing in your postcode, which you also might not know about, and then find out where you are. So what is it meant to do is this? Which base is based on location-based services, and it just connects to your mobile phone. It's a watch, and it just tells you where, how far you are from each of the voice bike racks, and whether there's voice bike rack spaces available. Okay. That's one way of doing it. So here we've got some effective experience. It's efficient too, but without this thing on your watch, you have to do, you have to jump through a number of other hoops to actually be able to um, find out what you need to do with your voice bike. The reason why I'm talking to you about this is because this might seem a trivial point, and it is trivial. But by decoupling this interface from the phone into this textual way, it means everybody can use it. It also means that any application can use it. Any application can use it based on understand what, where you are with regard to um, what, what most bike location is closest and how many free slots are there. Okay? Because the, the logic's going to be coupled. From the interface. So that's how it works. Okay. Um, this is something with, with regard to people with disabilities. Here, it's not critical. I mean, here it's kind of okay. It, it's, it's a nice thing. Here, it's critical. So this is a quote from um, a blind user that I've, uh, that I've worked with um, before. Uh, you, you do quite a lot of work on working blind individual disabilities. 
for me, computer system is everything. So my hi-fi, my source of income, my supermarket, my telephone, where my way is. Okay. So for most, for a lot of disabled people, a lot of disabled people, there is no other choice. In your, your technology, there's no choice. So if you make your job, technology hard, then that means that you disadvantage you disadvantage somebody. You disadvantage their policy problem. <coughs> so if you're a supermarket chain or you buy or you're building some some uh, shopping application for supermarket, then if you make it so it's not accessible or it takes a long time, that means what do you think that means to somebody's blind? What do you have to do if you're blind to actually build some food on to, work, to get some food in that context from the same test day? You have any help? You have to phone up test day and you have to say to them, what is this? You need to provide some one of your shop staff, it could be anyone who's the person who's left in the street, to, uh, to a company. You then have to get on, get to your, get on to your, uh, Get onto the bus, find the bus stop, get on the bus, get down to where Tesco is, get off the bus, go into Tesco, find the manager, find the right person, that person will allocate you something, that person will take you around and get like a child asking you, this is on the shelf, 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 what are you doing? So, and that takes lots of time and it's not dependent. When you make something like that up, you maximize it, oh, how does that work for um, somebody's ability to? Earn a living. You do a job. Okay. If your software goes around you to do their job, if you if, if you build Word and your version of Word doesn't allow isn't accessible, you allow them to do their job, then that means that they're going to be unable to work. They're not able to they won't be able to support their family in that context. Okay. So it's not trivial at all. It might seem it, but it's by your software directly influences people's lives. It's not just some angry bird parts okay, that nobody really cares about or can be crushed if you're anything and messing around in your company. Okay, it's none of that crap. It's actually serious. So how would you feel? That's what the personas are about. That's what that's what the scenario is about. How would you feel? Well, we've already seen barriers to this kind of effective use because the barriers that we've got to effective use are the similar barriers that we, uh, the similar um, kinds of perception and condition we have when we were talking about it's in the it's complicated lecture when we were talking about understanding human senses, understanding human perception. So here we've got visual. So going back to this, what does it mean to be blind? How? What does the definition of blind mean? Yes, you can see, you can distinguish the visual from the Some people can see it. So they were blind, you can see it. You can see color. You can see light. Okay, so how can you use that? Some people in the <coughs> might have macular degeneration, so you can, uh, both wet or dry, and so you can get peripheral vision. You can see things on the periphery, but the center is completely blocked out. There are a number of applications now, um, certainly, those that use three D glasses, those uh, Google cardboard glasses and uh, monitors that allow you to um, replicate these kind of um, disabilities. So you can, you know, be walking around with these on, but with a big, a big chunk of your um, vision chopped out, because that's how it is to have macular degeneration. So there's lots of so also colour blindness. You've got different contrasting colours that aren't controllable, that means that things can't be seen. Certain black, if you've got red, uh, red words, and red words that are not changed, <coughs> people can't see them. So if you're putting more of what the person is visually because there's lots of uh, colour blindness, that would not be happening because you've got a new vision to it. Many types, well, for all of these, it's many types, there's a large spectrum. So, there's a large spectrum of cognitive disability, uh, sort of ranging across all people, pretty much. Okay? And 
So in, in psychology, you've got cognitive uh, disability, but then you've also got cognitive impairment. But what you might also have is um, uh, cognitive type. So cognitive type means that people have a certain cognitive style. So therefore, a lot of people in the uh, deaf community learn British Sign Language as their first language, but might not know it. Okay, so therefore, how do you accommodate that? Well, maybe you accommodate it with avatars, maybe you accommodate it with computer generated uh, machine or lots of work is being done for this as well. Okay. Um, physical disabilities. What happens if you've got locked in um, syndrome, you need brain interfaces, that kind of thing. So these are bad. Combinatorial. Combinatorial here. In other people, other people will say seniors, old people, uh, like that, like that. which is just, in my opinion, bollocks. Okay. So combinatorial means that you have lots of low-level disabilities, low-level impairments. You might have trouble, but it's not bad enough to to get into the disability, um, you know, disability elements. You might not be, might not be any specialist material. Specialist um, uh, devices to, to, to help you with that. Uh, you might have failing eyesight and trouble, which together means it's a combinatorial environment. You might have failing hearing, hearing and eyesight. <coughs> These things can happen at any age. Now, they might be more prevalent the older you get, but what does that say? Does it doesn't tell you very much, in my opinion. So, in the, in the world outside this class, some people will refer to this as old people, old people, aging, seniors. I refer to the commentary, you have to decide what you think, whether you think it's commentary or aging. Okay, so let me give you an idea about what it's like to use the screen reader. So this is a this is a <coughs> this is a little bit on YouTube, hopefully you can use it about screen reader access. So this is for your own
no sound for this one, unfortunately. So this is generally, this was, I was trying to get across here that the level of speed and the speed that um, actually that these uh, screen readers read at is very high. So you can actually get through a lot of information. I mean, some actual reading speeds are up to 600 words a minute, whereas normal reading speeds are 180 words a minute. Okay. And that's still intelligible as well. Incredible. But it also means that there's low cognition, low comprehension, and low attention in information. Um, it also means that you've got lots of problems when it comes to reading things like websites or things like applications, because when you've got lots of nefarious information built into the interface, then it ruins the actual flow of information. So therefore, it ruins things like um, when you're talking and you've not labeled an image, or you've labeled an image with ING hydrogen 386, which is an email, then that's spoken to, so that, that is spoken to the person who's, uh, uh, who's trying to understand what that image is or what, what the hell is going on. It's very difficult to get an understanding of the image in that box of lots of practice, so that's really the bad thing. So that's why I wanted you to listen to the screen reader thing. Hopefully, you'll go back and look at the notes at some point in the future, and then you'll use your own computers to uh, listen to that. Um, while I send a nasty email to the technical support. Okay, so that's what you should be making do with it. Actually, has anybody followed along with the slides? No? I could plug you in and you could uh, have a go and see if it works. Anyway, I'm running out of time, I've only got six minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, so there are other barriers to to use you know, that are not seen as conventional. These are more unconventional barriers that myself and a number of people within the community support as being barriers and impairments, um, possible impairments, and other people don't. Okay, so it just depends. So what's this so this one here, what's this for? What's this stand for? What are the cool kids? I-18 there. What does 18 stand for? No idea. Okay, if I said A, 11Y, one, one, Ali, what would that stand for? No? I don't know, you guys think you're dead, aren't you? Okay, so 18 is the number of characters between I and A, and it stands for internationalization. So that's the right thing. Okay. And Ali is 11 characters between A and Y, which stands for access to Okay? So A1 and Y. So here, if you hear people talk about I18M, which they do all the time at uh, development conferences, it means language and understanding, it means internationalization. Okay? That's, the, that's, that's, that's one of the big barriers to effect use internationalization. If you've got websites which are in language, you've got people who don't speak that language. Try going to, um, you know, if you don't natively speak or you don't speak, say, Chinese, go to a Chinese website and see whether you can understand it. Okay, it's very difficult to understand that. Kind of you know, it's very difficult to understand it. It makes, and most of the time, culturally, the thing is that culturally, it's difficult, as you might say, it's difficult, it's difficult for people, say, like me, um, from the West, <coughs> from a well developed country, pretty much white ma male to understand the challenges that might occur if you're from a different country speaking a different language. Okay? So that's what the percentage of scenarios are about. And that's why this can be a disadvantage. Okay? My wife's Armenian <coughs> and she right, we, and, and Armenian script is very different from English script. So try reading some Armenian. Very few it's not like trying to be French and making some idea about what that might be. It's a lot more difficult to do. Okay? So the Russian suppose. And so therefore, that means it, it feels like an idea, right? It is an idea. That's the problem. So in that context, then you can actually try and understand the problems that people might have in your English. Okay? Therefore, you get is well, is information power, is knowledge power. It isn't why you're all here. Okay. 
So I'll say it is. So you're disadvantaging people in need some way to do some translation on it. So that's one thing to consider. Literacy. So literacy is a big deal. There's lots of people who are called who are, who are, who are functionally illiterate. So it means that they can read, they just don't know how. So that's a, that's an issue as well. If you use complex language, then complex language means that you might part that barrier, you can measure that barrier. Who's going to flash from K? Flash from K scale? Okay, so you can get you can get various metrics to understand how complicated the language is that you can use it on your interfaces, of your error messages, of your uh, documentation, of your user manuals. Okay, so you should make sure that you put your new list of flash from K scale, okay, which means that you can understand better how complicated this is for people to understand what level of education is required. It's based on the American grade level education system, so but you can still see that you know, the lower the grade, the, uh, you know, the less, the less background knowledge you need. I mean, most people, most educated people still only have, what is it, 2,000 to 5,000 word um, you know, uh, sort of uh, language, basically. That's, that's, that's the number of language, that's the number of words that they know. Um, sometimes, Situational impairment is about mobility. So situational impairment is about is about being um, if you're handicapped by your devices. So it means that the screen mirror states or the context of use, the device itself or the use of that device. The context of use of that device is in a, is making your ability to use it. Um, is removing your ability to use it. And then we've got developing regions. Developing regions are often about unconventional use. So this is whereby, and you'll see that you'll see the notes where we've got, so I, I mentioned this already with regard to Nokia telephone, telephone technology incorporated torches, because that was seen by anthropologists who were in, in various countries in Africa with those with lower energy supplies. So therefore these the people in Africa had their own um, uh, way of, of adapting the technology. Okay? Now this isn't one way, this is bi-directional, so that people can just get across. For instance, who, who uses the PayPal, the little PayPal app? If you don't know it anymore. The electronic money app that Barclay has for transferring money between, uh, between accounts, bank accounts. Yeah? Okay? So that kind, of, that kind of money, that kind of application was first invented and created about, oh, what, 15 years ago, using mobile phones in Africa, extensively used. Okay. And the same is true for uh, in India, lots of work, lots of, um, lots of work on the spoken web, and lots of work on understanding, on uh, managing your business just using uh, a mobile phone. Okay. Just using text messages on a mobile phone, even before WAP. So they remember WAP. I don't know if you remember that. Oh. Yeah, maybe. And then the final thing is low income. So low income is whereby you're unlikely to have a generic piece of, uh, sorry, a general purpose piece of computer machinery. So you've all got these computers and laptops and all that kind of stuff. Why should you have a general computer machinery? Most people, or lots of people on low income don't have that. They don't have that option. They might have uh, TV. They might have a mobile phone, they might have a great one, they might have a mobile phone, smart one, they might have a games console. That's the level of computer machine that they have. So if you're a child in that environment, are you as able to do your homework maybe, as efficiently and effectively as people who've got these nice computer systems? And if you're supposed to have such good computer systems, which you probably don't, then are you likely to have that kind of level of Maybe not. Maybe that's one thing that you know that, that can be thought about and building applications for data learning applications. What does it what do we assume? This is the question here for all of us. What is it that, what what do you guys assume that the 
person's life, what do they have? What, what's available to them? What's their background? What do they see in their that's, that's, that's what we're trying to get over. That's what we're trying to, to um, overtake. Okay, so device independence, as I've said, it's a, it's a loop. So here is a Pringles tube. So if you're going for that, the Pringles tube. Any ideas what the Pringles tube is doing? Yeah. Yes, it's transmitting Wi-Fi, and it's transmitting Wi-Fi. These were first invented by the guys in, um, in Africa, who wanted to have one, uh, one line into their village, and they wanted to, trans to transmit Wi-Fi around the entire village, and they wanted to Pringles tubes to transmit Wi-Fi so that the entire village would be covered in the distance, because it's very directional. Okay? And you can see these now, these are actually these are everywhere. Um, <coughs> so we've made our cross tubes, tube, pen torch, yeah, we've done that, it's nice to try. Okay. So here's some technical accessibility. This is just sort of uh, a bit of a history of where we've where we to. So first of all, we just have text. So what we did was, you know, in the old days we had MS-DOS and we had some Unix drawn together command line. John Latham would love the old days, okay, because in the years you have text, Command line good, right? So that's all that was there. I can remember writing <coughs> applications that spat up menus, just you know, two, one, two, three, four, and you know, that's good. Locked up the screen, and everything's in the right screen. Everything's in the And the reality is that that worked really good if you were blind. It, re it worked really well if you were, if you had lots, if you had different kinds of uh, critical disabilities, because it's very simple to use. Very few images, no, you know, you can't. And you've got no careers, you've got no different multimodal usage, none of that. So that makes it easier then, you don't have to refocus your attention. But, but then we have the good, it's got down in the Xerox mark, that's what I say. Okay, so then we've got goods. And we have then, then we have this idea, how can we understand these goods? And we have a thing called screen scraping. Okay? So screen scraping is a very interesting <coughs> old school old school solution. This old school school solution just looks at each pixel point by point on the screen and then decides in combination what that pixel means in combination with the pixel around it. So it does character recognition. So therefore it builds a, it builds a model based on not the explicit semantics, the explicit meaning of, of the green widgets, but on the implied meaning of a visual representation of that widget. Does that make sense? The implied, the implied semantics of the visual representation, as opposed to the explicit semantics of the actual widget itself. Right. Okay? And then as we got, we got more, in, more into this kind of stuff, we have a thing called the off-screen model. And the off-screen model replaced screen scraping. So you had the two models, like the model of the screen, and then because you understand using the Google using the Google toolkit, you can add more information to say <laughs> title, you can actually get that information from the title bar. You can get the information, you can get the, the um, labels which are associated with radio buttons or checkboxes, and you have a very thing called the off-screen model. The off-screen model is something whereby you can see it, you can see the screen, it allows access to the technology to understand it, the display and the interaction choices that are available. Because there was semantics, meaning associated with the widgets. What mainstream technology uses something like the off screen model currently? Come on, I know we've got a commitment currently in like a few minutes, but come on. Nearly much time, we'll go out in small separately. Just focus there. Off screen model. Right. In fact, here's 
to characters or images of things. The DOM. The DOM. The document object model is the thing that's contained the similar the non the not three model, the document object model, it sits behind the visual rendering. It sits the visual rendering um, <coughs> is what you actually see, but the document object model provides logical um, computability, if you like. Okay, we've got some initiatives that came through there. So we've got the Microsoft Active Accessibility Initiative, but now this is moved to iAccessible 2. Okay. So these initiatives are actually automated, uh, automation initiatives which allow you to tie in <coughs> your code, application code, to the accessible books. The good news is that as Java developers or developers of most systems and many things nowadays, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is make sure that everything is tagged, everything is on, is available, is associated with the, with the radio meter. That you look not just at the visual rendering, but you also look at what the actual joint semantics, <coughs> the logical coupling are of the, you know, of the interface. Okay? And then everything else, Microsoft Active Accessibility, iAccessible 2 will take care of this for you. Okay? It takes care of all of the rendering for you. So the reason why a screen really works, the reason why um, for instance, uh, um, the, uh, the um, text to speech synthesizers work on things like, you know, that built into the platform work on things like uh, the iPad or the iPhone or, or indeed uh, Windows desktop, etc. The reason why those work is because of these kind of frameworks. You can know something about the way that you actually do it. Now, the easy way to test this is to crank up the text to speech synthesizer on, the, on all your platforms and code something without very good descriptions, code a really bad interface, and see what crap you get back. Okay. That's the way to do it. That's the way to test. Test not by what you see, but by what the access technology enables you to hear, enables you to control. Okay. Control is also part of this. Um, accessible interface as well, so you can control, can control things by shortcut keys, even though that might not be an obvious option, as it might have on Max, but you can. Okay. So, we have, we've got this platform independent, independent software, we've got these interface bridges, and we can see that this is how Java, as an example, the Java virtual machine works with regard to its Java accessibility. So we have the Java application, and it's got the application, uh, uh, the Access API, which I'm saying you don't have to do anything. You've got the Java bridge classes, which do this communication between the virtual machine and the components that you created. And then you've got the access technology, which interfaces to the other side, okay, interfaces to the other side of this bridge, Java accessibility, Java accessibility bridge. And that means, that means that anything that you put here, gets to here, okay, native, it's a native virtual. So that means that any piece of access technology like JAWS or anything like that, you can use that, etc., will, will work natively. Even though um, you're actually capable of the job, but you don't have to do anything apart from make sure there's a shortcut key for every function. Okay? Don't expect it just to be clickable from the mouse. Make sure there's a way of controlling the mouse. Okay, if, you, if you decide to deviate from the way that you can do your uh, All of this stuff you need to really do. Make sure that you've got descriptive titles in all of your widgets, on all of your labels, and all of your uh, uh, windows. Okay. So that those if those descriptive titles are not present, the actual accessibility technology just does nothing. If I can't control the function, obviously there's no way for the accessibility to just know it. So what you're doing is you're making everything that might be implied by the graphic or the user interface, you're making it in explicit as opposed to implicit here. So as long as it's all explicit, the technology takes care of everything else. So if you don't remember anything from today, always remember, make Everything that's implied by the visual rendering explicit in the actual code base. Okay. Okay. Um, Ajax 
is real mode HI chart. Okay. And then we've got as, as the, the thing that allows Ajax to work for accessibility is what we call carrier. Okay, so accessible rich internet applications, so that's the thing that allows that to work on your web and on your browsers. It works the thing that allows Java to work with this asynchronous Java. Okay? Ajax. Okay. Remember to read the next chapter next week. Start using 